Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Center for the Less Good Idea uh, and to this evening's presentation of How Showing Making. My name is Athena Mazarakis, and I'm the monitor of SO, the Academy for the Less Good Idea. And this How series uh, falls under the umbrella of the Academy, and as its name suggests, it gives us this unique opportunity to get really up close to an artist's process. This evening, we are beyond excited and delighted to feature and welcome the phenomenal Mary Sibande, who will do the very brave work and vulnerable making work of opening up her process to us. Mary is not only an incredible multidisciplinary artist, but also our neighbor here at Arts on Main. And it's always a distinct pleasure for me to kind of walk past and catch glimpses of Mary at work. And so I know that tonight and having chatted through this and seen what Mary has prepared for us, that it's going to be a, a really unique um, opportunity to, to get a sense of her strategies, her approaches, the background to her work. Mary will be joined this evening by Lawrence Lemawana, fellow artist and lecturer. And together they're going to deconstruct one of her images and in that way do a bit of a re reversible journey for us. So tracing back from this image some of the threads that take us further back into her earlier bodies of work. They're also joined this evening by seamstress Pretty Nyati. And on the strings this evening we have Tembin Kosi Mavimbela. So with that, a big round of applause for everyone and welcome and enjoy. symbolizes a crucial emotion within human existence. A number of Siswati and Isuzul expressions or idioms highlight the ferociousness of anger and, dev and the devastation it may cause. The red explores the collective feeling of anger felt towards the ongoing inequality today. This recurring motif of the red dog, a reference to Zulu expression epitomizing anger. Umgodoi, let me tell you something about Imi Godoi. 
Umgotoi is an overly thin malnourished dog whose mouth unendingly oozes slimy saliva, a sign of obvious illness related to malnutrition. It is nauseating to look at such a dog, hence it is chased away in disgust. Nobody bears the sight of such a dog. Unkotoi is an insulting Zulu term for a man who behaves like a mongrel. We should be vigilant so that we don't have Imikodoi taking charge of our lives. <laughs> As a visual artist, I have been attempting to understand my personal history and the broader history of South Africa. I've also been reflecting on my own lived experiences and also of my community, of my family, and sometimes mass media or what we are given um, from the media. I have used idioms and expressions as a starting point and using these visual metaphors. The title of this work is The Locus. The Locus is a container. It's a container for a number of um, emotions. Whether it will be joy, courage, love. But in the Nguni languages, the locus contains a broader range of emotions. It'd be patience, impatience, tolerance, intolerance, etc. I grew up in a small town um, in Barberton. Um, so as a child, every time when we go to town, um, I'll see this dog outside the city hall. This dog is made out of bronze. It's life size and it's actually placed on the ground. Remember with um, public sculptures, they usually put up the you have to respect them, the icons, you have to know who are the leaders of the yesterday year. But this dog is actually put on the ground. So when you stand next to it, there's this forged um, relationship. Woman, dog, man, dog. And what I like or what drew my attention to this dog the more I grew older and starting to learn what this sculpture meant to Barberton. This dog is actually popular. There's movies written about this dog. There's, there's actually even TV games. Uh, there's animation. There's even literature. <clears throat> so when I was thinking of a type of breed to use in my anger, or in my exploration of anger. Oh, there's so many breeds in the world, dog breeds. So I thought of the German Shepherd. We all know the German Shepherd. Um, there's always this image in my head that pops up. 1976, June 16. There's a policeman who's holding back this leaping um, German Shepherd that's about to no, rip apart this black student. And of course this dog, the German Shepherd, has been used to insert fear in many townships. I know this. Born in 1982, I did kind of experience it. <laughs> so for me, it was just far away. I was like, no, I don't, I don't. No, there's just something off about this dog. Let me just go back to my childhood dog that I used to see when I was a child. It felt comfortable using that dog and it felt right. 
because that there is that forged relationship. I had a brief that I sent to, to the foundry. I was like, guys, I need you guys to make me an angry dog. And I remember Michael looking at me from Loop Foundry in White River. I was like, who would make an angry dog? She's going to show teeth. And he was like, you know, like Staffordshire Bull Terriers are not actually vicious. I was like, yeah, I know, like, unless you teach it to be. Um, I was like, OK, I, what we need to do is the viewer needs to hear the snarling and hence the tense. Muscles are tense, body is tense. Further, the teeth are exaggerated. They look like um, wolf's teeth, or maybe a bear. And the face is just, when you look at the face, you want to run. And of course, the color is not natural. Looking at this image, that was the relation. It started there, and it came to here. Noah, take us to the next slide, please. Let's go to Japan. Years ago, I stumbled upon the story of Yasuke. Very remarkable story. So Yasuke ascended to the highest rank of being a samurai. Unbelievable. It almost sounds like a myth, mythological story. An African black man traveling all the way to Japan being on the highest rank of being a samurai. I'm saying this because history is, is telling us that black people didn't move freely. History is telling us black people were static, not only geographical, but also in terms of class. And then here's Yasuke about 400 years ago. I was like, I need to take this story and make an artwork out of this story. This is a bronze sculpture. It's about 80 centimeters high. And that's the relationship that I wanted to create about Yasuke. I wanted to take a story almost like, just I couldn't get enough of, 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 of his story. They say it's easy to learn a language over a pillow. I've asked my partner, Lawrence Timawana, to join me tonight. Because some of these artworks that you'll see tonight, we were both there, we traveled the world together. And it only makes sense that I invite him. A fellow artist, of course. Good evening. Um, so just to kind of extend the story of uh, Yasuke, <clears throat> Mira and I kind of deal with a lot of um, arguing, uh, platforming ideas. We um, unpack the myths that she wants to present. And so the story of Yasuke is also reminiscent of another story of um, Odetta. In the 1960s, an African-American woman went to Japan and produced a whole album that was inspired by the sounds 
by the um, the singing the culture. Mm -hmm. by the culture of Japan. And I think the message to get out of this is that Mary's work also deals with uh, the notion of being rhizomic, that one thing can sprout somewhere, grow um, uh, roots, travel, and sprout somewhere else. And I think this is the narrative that um, kind of is evident in the majority of what Mary produces. So the step uh, uh terrier becomes something that is a memory and suddenly becomes something to be kind of looked at as a large, aggressive war dog. And so the work is kind of constantly reflecting on personal history, but also it's also about constructing new mythologies. And so um, this is the kind of journey that we try mm -hmm. to kind of unpack within the work. Mm. Next slide, please, Noah. So when I was thinking about this work, I thought of um, Lawrence and I were watching, um, I think it's, a, I forgot the program on Netflix. Um, so there is, um, so as Devlin was talking about her practice. So as Devlin is a, is a, a theater stage designer. stage designer. Yes. And she speaks about the democracy of theater. So the idea is wherever the audience or the viewer is looking, they have to get an experience. Whether it's from high up there, on the left center, doesn't matter. So for me, this work is about that, or at least an attempt. And now these dogs are on the stage. If you look at that dog on the, on the left there, it looks like it's limping, it's tired, because anger is tiring. And these dogs have been out there fixing the world. And now they've come back to the red figure to be fed. Next. The red figure is feeding the dogs um, a bit of a, a piece of the heart. So imagine if it was a movie, all these tired dogs will come into stage and then the figure will bite um, um, its heart, the locust, and then feed each dog, each tired dog, and then each dog will, the do each dog will grow like four heads. I think what is also fascinating about um, the motif of the dog is that it appears a few times um, in some of our encounters. One of them is a random cover of um, James Cotier's Disgrace. Um, and it's, it's used there as an illustration, but it becomes something that is functional and becomes something that is more conceptual than representational. And I think that's also another kind of element that we try to kind of work with when we argue about these kind of ideas and concepts. The other kind of almost glaring um, metaphoric representation of the dog is um, the dog that guards the, in Greek mythology, the, the, that guards the, the, the gates of hell. Um, is it called the Cerebrus? Cerebrus. Yes, Cerebrus. And so, the dog that you see there is, comes from those kind of conceptions. But then the other okay. kind of artistic um, reference, I think Mary kind of touched upon it when she was doing the uh, uh, presentation um, or reading earlier on, is that um, that David Kolwane created a body of work that was very critical of the forthcoming government, the ANC government. Um, and she, he created a series called uh, Mikotoi. And the extension of that was that um, that Tabombeki did a speech that spoke about this Mkotoi. Mm -hmm. So Mkotoi becomes a really complicated conceptual representation. And I think that's why the, there's always an element of adding and subtracting. So the malnourished kind of look, but then it's also muscular. So there's a kind of tension of ambiguity that like Mary's also presenting with the work. 
Next slide, Nava. These dogs have been sent out there. The previous image, they're coming back to the motherboard. Um, I was seven months pregnant here. Yes. Um, and what I've realized is that when one is pregnant, emotions are heightened. And that's when this body of work was conceived. I wanted to explore emotions. The image for, for us kind of has got, the title is called <coughs> Right Now, which again is referenced from uh, another production. It's from a song by Nina Simone um, called Pirate Jenny. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment in the song, which is also very kind of theatrical, where she also leashes the hounds of hell on so like presses. right now, go out there right now. Yeah. So this purple figure is going, go out there right now, go fix, go fix exploitation, go fix Ooh. injustice, go fix slavery, go fix apartheid. <sighs> but it's art, it's an artwork, you know? And then, <laughs> and then when you speak, when, when she speaks about the, the, the idea of the theater of democ or the, the democracy of theater. Um, it's also in kind of embedded in the work mm -hmm. that the work is kind of attempting to also break the fourth wall. Um, again, another theatrical reference. Um, we often watch series together, and one of the series that we watch is a, is a series called House of Cards. And House of Cards has also got another layer to it in that it comes from or references the Shakespearean process of breaking the fourth wall. Okay. Um, I think it's in King, um, what is it? Uh, King Lear. King Lear, yes. Mm -hmm. Where the figures speak directly to the audience. And this is also like another attempt to kind of think about the work as something that is theatrical, that the lighting is controlled, to kind of speak to that notion of peering into the space. So there's a three, three dimensional kind of like exploration of the two dimensional work. Mm. And also the, the smoke um, machine to create drama um, and also highlight the figure. And um, so when we're thinking of what the size we should print this image, we had a long debate. Lawrence and I was like, print it this big or this big. And I was like, you know what, let's just go big. So, the actual image is two meters in width. So the idea is I wanted this dog to pull out. I wanted the dog to threaten. So when you are looking at this image, you can almost feel like, okay, they're coming to my space. No, I think it's also slide. quite important to kind of express the idea that um, there's a, um, a process which began again many years ago um, when we were students, uh, a, um, the figure Sophie. And the figure Sophie was kind of done on a student budget. It was like very rudimentary processes. The, um, the casting was also quite basic. And, um, and then we called upon uh, people in the art world to assist us. Um, mm -hmm. So the first cast of Sophie was actually done in um, uh, Angus Taylor's studio. Uh -huh. So that's where Mary kind of began to use the, the, the lost wax process or the, the process of, of also, casting. Yeah, and into also the learn work. how to cast in, what's that material? In silicone. Silicone, yeah. Which has also become a, a kind of working process in the work. Mm -hmm. And why I'm also referencing that is that like, this is how, for example, the sheep heads were cast. So um, part of the journey was that we would, as students, we would like walk around the city of Johannesburg. We find ourselves at, uh, for example, um, Hollywood Studios, Hollywood Displays, just down the road here. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is that because uh, we're looking for these fragments of things that were quite uh, unavailable to us, so we would go and uh, kind of pick up parts cut them out, and then learn how to cast with the material. So there's a, almost like a, an attempt to 
create a conceptual understanding of what we're making. Mm -hmm. So the, the fragmented elements were put together um, to kind of uh, work in this way. So the sheep was also kind of done in, in, in that way. And then also, I think one of the factors that are um, often missed about the work that Mary creates is that the, the, the primary kind of focus or the beginning of her career, she was actually a painter. <laughs> so you'll notice that there's a, a lot of kind of bold use of color. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of merging from the undergrad and understanding how color operates, how relationships can be forged within the different kind of mediums. Mm. So this is 2014, yeah, 14, maybe 13, or well, somewhere there. I'm in, I'm in Paris. Um, I'm, I'm on a residency um, at the museum. It's called Musée McVal, McVal Museum. Um, so I was there for three months, and um, at the end of the residency, I, I had a, sh a solo. And the curator and I had been talking back and forth before I left South Africa. She said, well, come and make the work here. I like, okay, great. So I was there and I presented this concept to them. And they were like, no, you're not gonna finish this in three months. <laughs> it's just a lot of work. And then um, the curator came up with this idea of um, going to the local um, college and um, getting, I think there were four, four, four or five um, textile students um, to come and assist in the making of this work. Because at the same time, I wanted people who understand fabric. And, and with this work, next slide, I wanted to manipulate fabric. So this is actually all fabric. I've been making dresses, like, you know, dresses that can actually fill up this whole room. But now I was at a point where what can fabric do that is not a dress? So these roots, um, they are supported with um, fiber fill um, or wire and then fiber fill stuffing and then fabric on top using different um, shades of purple. And um, so this concept came about, um, so Lawrence introduced me to a text um, Deleuze on the rhizome, Deleuze and Ketari, and the idea of roots and how roots actually travel and form forms underneath where we don't actually see and they when they spring out, becomes a tree or weed or whatever. So I think just to kind of even reiterate what you're saying, so the conversation was around this idea of um, exploring some of the stuff that is unseen, that is not visible or that is not clear. And so this figure was also kind of created in a also unfamiliar way in that Mary had to collaborate with people that she wouldn't necessarily collaborate with. So the foundry is different to the one that she's like used locally. She also worked with these young people who were understanding textile in a way. And I think also what was interesting about this was that the challenge was to kind of create work um, or at least see fabric in a linear fashion. So the, the roots themselves kind of like demand a, a kind of linear focus where in some of the works, for example, this, this is all textile. So it's about mm -hmm. understanding the materiality of um, uh, textile. And I think that notion of thinking in a way that is uh, materialistic but conceptual comes from our undergrad, where when we studied at UJ, um, our, um, the former head of department was actually Willem Bosov. And he left a really kind of uh, powerful, um, what do you call it, a powerful uh, sign for, for us to follow, that, that uh, material isn't just about materiality, it's about like how mm -hmm. the meaning can be generated through manipulation, understanding. So the inherent qualities of the thing can be pushed in different directions. So the work also becomes about this idea of challenging uh, one, what we know about uh, different materials. Next slide, Noah. Taking cue from um, Franz Fanon's well-known text on violence. And I think Lawrence will be actually great to expand on that because you know why? 
your work is about text and also the purple body work is about slogans and of course in South Africa we used or slogans were used to gather people um, under the same ideology so yeah I mean the 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 so the purple has got multiple meanings um, the first meaning or at least the, the, the emergence of the purple figure or the purple Sophie comes from a, a body of work called um, mm -hmm. The People Shall Govern, or The Purple Shall Govern. And this was a, a historical reference. So in 1989, there was a protest that happened in Cape Town where um, people were protesting against the then uh, apartheid government. And the police uh, kind of laced them or, or, or sprayed them with purple water. And this purple dye actually was hard to remove. And so then it marked them for arrest after the violence had come down. So that is one kind of reference that kind of emerged out of this. But the other reference um, was a work that actually came earlier in the series called um, the... Um, Which one is that? <laughs> the Blue Series. Oh, uh, uh, Long Live the Dead Queen. Long Live the Dead Queen. So, Long Live the Dead Queen um, is a homage to Mary Sivande's forebears. So, her mother, her grandmother, her great-grandmother. And it was a series that like, looked at blue as a, a color of labor. So, connecting the, um, 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 the color to um, the work that they did. But then, in representing herself in that narrative, uh, Mary chose purple. And purple, of course, is more valuable. Um, it is a color that, when she did her research, represented, for example, wealthy people at the time. So if you're clergy, if you are wealthy, you would wear a purple shirt. So it metaphorically kind of represented her ability to express herself, um, where her forebears could not express herself in the way that she did. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a color that spoke of privilege or the privilege to be able to express her, herself. And I think what was interesting, again, it was also like a turn from representing narratives that she kind of acquired from her forebears. So the Long Live the Dead Queen was about speaking to her, her elders, asking them what their narratives were. And I think it's something that like becomes quite, um, uh, what do you call it, um, a careful consideration because part of this notion of telling stories or at least telling other people's stories is about how do you ethically represent people? How do you uh, uh, speak to um, uh, a people that could not express themselves in the way that they, that they, that they could? And so having the privilege to do that was, was something that was considered quite strongly in, 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 in that body of work. So the purple kind of represents the breakaway from that series. And I think what is also interesting is that, again, in terms of color theory, if you combine red and blue, you get purple. So there's a, also like a conceptual understanding of what these things could mean. Mm. So when I was thinking of when I was conceptualizing about this idea, I wanted to shoot it underwater because I wanted to, I wanted the creatures to fall, float. And I also wanted my dress to float. Um, but then it was kind of impossible because <laughs> I can't swim, firstly. <laughs> and then, and then um, the photographer was like, these things will just get wet and just go, they'll sink into the bottom of the pool. So, oh, so how do we do that? And then had to um, conceptualize and uh, talk to Peter about this idea. I was like, Peter, I want to do this. How can we actually show that this garment is underwater with all the elements? We're like, we're thinking, we're thinking. It's like, okay, maybe an octopus, tentacles, if we just do it like that, where the, you know, the, 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 the tentacles are floating. So we got it. And then there's, dress came out like that. So it's actually supported with invisible strings or invisible, invisible gut. Um, so at this time, this was actually, I was still 
thinking of my pregnancy. And um, so this figure is giving birth to the creatures. Imagine if it was actually a movie. Push out, then hang each creature, push, hang, push, to a point where now these creatures are becoming a forest and about to cover um, her space. And I think the, the other kind of metaphoric element to that is that, mm -hmm. so you'll notice that like the, 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 the apron is falling off. There's also, the scarf is also like flying away. And then if you look closely at, at just above her head, there's a, her non-sealing wing being. Non-being, non-winged. Non -winged. <laughs> yes, putting a crown on, 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 on the head. And again, it's kind of to acknowledge the, the, the kind of change in narrative, the kind of shift in understanding of how to tell uh, stories. And I think that's also like something that is, is also evident in, in, in the work. So for example, the, the sheep, uh, the sheepskin was also constructed in the studio. It was a, a matter of getting the shine in the right way and then and using stuffing to kind of um, give, give you that body. kind of fetish looking uh, element. And then Combining these elements together kind of spoke to this notion of, um, again, another Shakespearean uh, quote, the idea of being dressed up in borrowed robes, like to, to kind of be the angry dog that also possesses an element of innocence. This idea of like the sheep combining with the head speaks to the notion of innocence or, 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 or kind of not knowing. Mm. And I think that's um, one of the elements that are uh, important to note in the work. So um, what, I've, what I've also learned is that there are two types of um, anger. There's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. So righteous anger seeks restoration and unrighteous anger seeks destroy, just destruction, just destroy, destroy, destroy. And I think the, 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 again, unpacking our thinking all the time, and we, we always go back to texts, we go back to um, um, songs, lyrics, that kind of become quite, uh, uh, what do you call it, meaningful. And, and, we, and, 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 and there's an, always an attempt to try a, a find a, a, an emotionally and conceptually a visual equivalent of the, the kind of things that, that is attempting to be said. So the purple body of work is about <coughs> generally a, a, an idea of like resistance, but also the privilege of that. Mm -hmm. And then the exploration of, of the red also speaks to the notion of pain. And that's one of the things that, that, that we, uh, I think she, she read about and unpacked, the, the, the kind of mitigation of, 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 of pain and how to kind of deal with pain, not only just as a, as a, a howl or a, or a, or a, or a, or a scream, but mm -hmm. how do you kind of represent it in, in, or represent its embodiment? And this, this is how the, the kind of dog was also kind of, I guess, impregnated with those qualities. Mm. And also um, pain mimics death. And as soon as um, someone is described as dying, it means death has already begun. So these dogs will inflict death or will inflict pain mm. and the rest. Next, next slide, Noah. Now, we are in Brazil, Lawrence and I, 2000 and, what year was that? 2009, 2010, yeah. No, it was 13. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we usually do when we, we've traveled the world together, what we usually do um, when we go to any country in the world is we take the red bus. So what, that's, a, that's a thing, there's a red bus anywhere in the world. We also have our own in Joburg. Um, so um, we, we, you know, you stop from uh, uh, cultural spaces, museum, etc. So there was, there was this one cultural space that we stopped at, or we made a stop at. And um, we learned about the capoeira. So the capoeira is, um, is a dance that, um, it's, martial, it's a martial arts dance that um, black Brazilian used to practice or rehearse. So from a naked eye, it just looks like, oh, they're dancing. 
Um, but the idea was to take over the master's house. So I, I thought of a work, when I got back, I was like, I need to make a work about this fascinating thing that I just, that I just found out. Um, and also, what I've also realized with my sculptural work, I've seen people just look at, look at my work, go around, and that's it. So I thought of a work where you, as a viewer, you have to animate it. If you don't move, the work won't move. So this work, when you're walking around the plinth, depending on where you are, um, it looks like these figures are about to embrace each other. And a few steps away, it looks like they're about to combat each other. And then now it's the blue and the purple on the same plinth standing facing each other. It's my forebears looking at me with the purple figure represents me and it's about to be a, an embrace or however you can interpret it. And I think, yeah, so, so the, the work is also like, I think kind of also defines uh, that, that notion of change from, again, from one face to another. And um, the reference to the work was uh, a couple of um, images. One of them is, is Goya's two figures fighting um, or clubbing each other. So that was the, 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 the one expression that was kind of unpacked from that. But also it was this kind of notion of like um, um, speaking to ambiguity, that like it's, it's, it wasn't necessarily about a, a specific moment or a specific time or a specific battle. It's about um, what I think uh, um, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about in, in, in the Souls of the Black Folk. This, idea of this continuous battle within, this kind of notion of um, what the world sees what, and, and against what am I internally. And so there's these kind of conversations around that, like how there's always this continuous battle between the self that is no longer there but exists today and in this form. And I think that's also like the kind of way in which the, the, the work kind of um, um, moves on. Next slide, Mara. Again, traveling the world together. We're in New York. The, the traveling together. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you? I have to point out is a is a is a, a random, but a um um. But well, well, there have been trips where the, you travel alone. I also yes. travel alone. Yes. But it just so happened that <laughs> most of the works that we're showing tonight <laughs> were together. So, so, many, so many years ago, um, um, I was known as the artist Lawrence Limawana, and usually Mary was referred to his girlfriend Mary. Or actually, un, like, they never actually called I didn't you have by a name. name. No name. It was I just that. and his girlfriend. And, <laughs> and so, what was interesting with that uh, scenario was that um, I won a little prize. Um, it was the, big then. It's still it was big now. <laughs> <laughs> at the Upside Atelier, which uh, afforded me an, uh, an opportunity to go to France for three months. And I think that was when we made the decision that wherever the one goes, the other one has to tag along. Um, and we find ways of doing that. And so I think that's where the kind of uh, references and the kind of echoing each other kind of comes from. That like what I know what you know, or at least I know what you Sound might be board. thinking. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. terrible at playing uh, uh, charades or these games where you have to guess um, <laughs> the work. But yeah, so this work was uh, um, found in... In New York. Yes. So Lawrence and I are walking in Central Park. Central Park, Park yes. And then uh, we came across this poster of Madame C.J. Walker. And we started reading the synopsis. Like, oh, this is, this is interesting. So, um, and then Lauren's like, wow, this is, this is actually an amazing story. So now we go back and Google. This was like t 2000 and, um, 2008, 2008. Yeah. Like the phones were not so smart like right now. <laughs> um, so we go back to the residency, we just we Google this icon. So cause for me already it was like, okay, this is it. Um, so um, what I, what, what I gathered from, um, from Google or, and also research, because I had, well, had to research further, 
and there's actually movies now about mm. Madame C.J. Walk on a movie on Netflix. Um, so Madame C.J. Walker was um, born in, in the 1920s, and then um, she was the first black female millionaire. Such a remarkable story for a black woman in America um, to actually be a millionaire. She made her money through her cream relaxer. In the black community, hair is huge. How you wear your hair, your hair, whether it's a weave, braids, afro, dreadlocks, it just says, it says a lot about you. It's your identity. And then here, a figure that is Sophie weaving the, an image of this icon and using synthetic hair. Next image. So that is a canvas, and the image is actually um, sort of like similar to how you would do a graffiti image. So you block out the rest and you take out the, the dark colors. So what I did was I used a needle with synthetic hair. So it was just stitching on the canvas. <laughs> and the, the connection is also personal, but also quite uh, uh, significant. So Madame CJ Walker found her liberation through this process My of back. straightening hair. So she yeah. became a millionaire and she became like a, an icon in the 1920s. And in fact, she also became, I think, a civil rights activist at the, at, at, at the same time where she kind of funded uh, a lot of projects um, on um, liberation. But last. the personal connection but is we'll that um, when Mary's mom was young, um, she okay. used to work in a hair salon. And um, in this hair salon, she then found uh, ideas of, of entrepreneurship to the point okay. where she came to Johannesburg and also then began a spaza shop. And so the connection between Madame C.J. Walker and um, Mary's mom became a congruent parallel narrative. And again, kind of reinforcing this notion of um, um, the rhizomic kind of process where something insignificant happening in, in, in parts of the world, connecting to another part of the world and being you know, a mirror image that is maybe more of a distorted image um, and so that's why I think the, the kind of process was to kind of create almost like this mm -hmm. almost umbilical cord between these connected stories. Um, and I think also the, the other factor that is quite uh, important in, 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 the, in this work was this kind of, kind of uh, idea of um, making these voluminous work. This idea that like Sophie isn't necessarily just about presence, it's about big presence. Um, so I think that the, 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 the um, uh, what do you call it, the circumference of that um, um, dress, oh, that's dress about six is about meters. six meters. And it was, it was about making a bold statement about this woman who raised her. But the other part that is also quite uh, interesting about this is that like this homage also speaks to Mary's liberation. Um, because if her mom did not have the bravery or the entrepreneurial spirit to move out of Barberton and explore other ways, she wouldn't have gone to university or been uh, gone to uh, tertiary. Mm -hmm. So there's also like this kind of um, um, autobiographical writing that is using these experiences to, 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 to create the work. Um, so in 2009, I had a, a solo show at a prominent gallery and um, and I felt the need to bring all these women, my forebears, into the space, whether it be spiritually or psychologically and also physically. Um, so the show was curated in a way that when you walk in, um, you, the first figure, because these figures are actually life-size, they're as tall as me. Um, when you walk in, the first figure that you come across is um, Sophie Elsie. So Elsie was my great-great-grandmother. Then you continue in another room. There's another figure there that represents my grandmother, Sophie Merika. That's my grandmother's name. And you continue to another room. This is the figure that you'll see, um, Sophie Velusha. 
That's my mother. And then on the last room on your way out, um, a purple figure stood there, Sophie Ndombigaise. That's my other name. So, um, next image, please. So when I was thinking of naming this avatar or alter ego, because Sophie is my alter ego, I, there was just this back and forth debate. Should I give her an African name? Should I give her an English name? And I consulted with um, my family members. Oh, they love to tell stories. <laughs> um, and I asked my uncle, like, how is it that my name is Ndobigai Semeri and your name is Fowel Tami? And um, the story that he told me that in, during apartheid South Africa, a black child would not be enrolled in a school if they didn't have um, an English name at least. So that idea was to show that the natives ha have converted into Christianity and are educated. But at the, on the other end of this, it was suppressing one's identity. I guess that's why a lot of South African um, visual artists or artists are grappling with the notion of identity in their work. I may be wrong. So this work, um, I wanted to put this avatar, I wanted to put this representation of my women, of the women in my family on a pedestal. And I thought of a physical pedestal where you look you know, you have to look at them and why they're high up there. And it didn't feel right. And I thought of a crown. Let me just put them in a crown. Let's put a crown. And, but the crown was just taken for me. I was like, no, it just doesn't feel right. Beads, beads were actually made sense. I was like, I'm gonna create a halo. I don't, it doesn't really have, I don't really have to have a crown. But this halo will actually ascend this image or this figure without actually putting them on a pedestal or crown or whatever. And also, the pose is a reference to, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Celestial images of Mary. Yes, of Mary, Mary. <laughs> Mother um, <of> Jesus. <laughs> but also, um, it's um, Christian iconography. Mm. Mm. So I wanted to bring that, and of course, going back to naming. So this has a relationship, naming Christianity, Christianity how it was introduced in South Africa, but it, was, it started in the Eastern Cape and then, you know, poured all, all over the country. And as I mentioned earlier on, the figure that is Sophie, whatever she thinks of with her eyes closed, it becomes real. She's denying her reality. She's denying um, a relationship with the viewer. You're not important. She is. Remember, she wasn't important anymore uh, before, pre in, in previous lives. And the idea is that the beads are on the, are on the floor. They're actually clinging and climbing and creeping and creating this mantle. Um, and this actually performance, it continues in your head beyond the picture that you see right now. And so, I mean, the, the, the naming also became a, a kind of motif that um, is functional. So uh, the story also began a little bit earlier with uh, your great-grandmother who died oh, yeah. with, with two names. So um, she was known as... Oh, she, she, she had two African names, Teledi Fanedi, but she died with one African name, Teledi, and then she was given an English name, Elsie. So for me, this idea of naming Sophie, Sophie, um, it was about that, like going back into my personal history. So I, I don't want to forget that story. So every time when I call out Sophie, I always remember Elsie. And that's also very important um, in, my, in my artwork. And, and we, as we kind of say, like, we have these conversations and we kind of unpack the things that we do. So one of the studies that um, we came across was the study of names. Uh, it's called onomastics. 
And one of the, the things that they say in onomastics is that like a thing that is not named doesn't exist. So for, for, for things to be, they have mm. to have a name. So for us to comprehend a dog, we need to Call name it, it a mm. dog. Mm -hmm. And so naming becomes a, 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 not only a function of, of identifying something, but also kind of giving life to it. And mm -hmm. that's why I think there was a, this kind of crisis of what, 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 how do you name Sophie? What, what is it that, that you kind of um, apply to, to, to identity? Mm. No, our next slide, please. This is 2008. Lawrence and I are doing our fourth year. We're yeah. in the same class. Um, so I tell Lawrence, like, Lawrence, I have this crazy idea. You're not going to believe it. Picture this, picture this. See me <laughs> in an infinity wall, dressed up as Sophie. I'm going to make the garment. Um, and then um, Sophie will stitch the Superman um, um, uh, jersey. And I was like, mm, this, this image is too simple. There must be something else. That's the thing about Lawrence. There's <laughs> always, there must be something else. And I'm saying this because um, you're a conceptual artist. And what I've actually picked up is that no material is good enough to actually illustrate or convey this idea that you have in your head to a point where you end up talking about the work but not making it, which is amazing. Between you, between you and I, <laughs> between you and I, we made like millions of artworks that will never be shown anywhere in the world. But also, you don't have to exhibit everything that you, you know, so the, see in your head. With that, <laughs> so... Uh, this work, um, I think it's, it, it, it's become an iconic work. Um, again, kind of began as a very kind of rudimentary process. So um, the figure, um, and, and, and this is another quality that I think is significant in, 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 in Mary's work. The idea of whether a person is looking at a physical sculpture or it's Mary performing. And that ambiguity is actually um, um, part of the design. That, that, that there's, a, there's a kind of like a seamless transition between viewing a three-dimensional representation of the, of the narrative or that it was done in a limited audience in front of a cameraman and maybe uh, an assistant. Mm -hmm. And so, and um, the work was done again using collaborative connect, connects. Mm. Um, it was uh, photographed by uh, John, yeah, John Hodgkiss's assistant, mm -hmm. um, who had who was studying at Market Photo Workshop, and the work was actually produced initially in her. So initially, the shoot was in her studio, at her house, and then, um, but the image didn't come out well. So. She showed me the end results, like, no, I think we need to reshoot. And I'm like, really? Like, we just put like, a lot of hours, and then now we have to reshoot. It's like, trust me, trust me. And I think that's when I learned about photography, because um, I'm not a photographer, and I don't pretend to be, and I don't follow the principles of photography. I always work with photographers. So before an idea or a concept, I'll just lay down my um, uh, references, I go, I want this kind of lighting. And I'll pull out a song, whether it's a Kanye West song or an 80s song or whatever. And then I'll pull out a fashion, um, a fashion um, page. Like the, 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 the dress will kind of look like this, but it's actually influenced by roots. So, and then I'll have all my references because I want the photographer to understand and see what I'm seeing. So I always spend time with them. And then all these photographs that you've seen tonight, it's that collaboration, like understanding to a point where once in a while, I'll go back to the same um, um, photographer. Well, Kala moved to New York and how she moved to New York after the shoot was um, such a remarkable story. So um, after the shoot, she said, don't pay me. I was like, okay. And of course I was like, yay, because I'm fourth year student. I don't have money to pay her. And it was such a successful shoot. It's like, no, I heard that you guys are going to New York. Can I take along? I'll stay with you guys for like four weeks, and then I'll, I'll be out of your. Head. I was like, okay, fine.
fine, fair, fair trade. But she stayed with us for like a week and then off she went to her friends and then um, found love, a, a love yeah. in New York and she's still so, there to this day. <laughs> so, so, so I think, I think, that's, I think for, for us that's a very kind of important um, quality to have in, in the production of the work, that mm -hmm. the, 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 the making is not just limited to physical making, it's about the spirit that kind of drives the work. And I think it's something that like kind of emerged long ago when mm -hmm. we were collaborating, uh, exploring um, the, the kind of ways in which the work can kind of um, transform and grow and so on. I, I must be honest, I did not have faith in this work um, and I was very wrong. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that I had was that um, Superman is, is a very kind of iconic figure. And white male. White male, and it, it doesn't work. But I think what, when Mary kind of like unpacked the narrative um, or as to how and why the work exists, is that like it, it goes back to her, her childhood where her great-grandmother was mm -hmm. making jerseys for her. And these jerseys were often imperfect. They had flaws in them. I wish um, I kept them. Yeah, they had holes where mm. there shouldn't be holes. Mm. And so the work... I think she was still, she was still learning. She was a student yeah. in making jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> so the work kind of uh, speaks to that, this kind of a homage and speaking to this woman who is um, um, not a superhero to many, but a superhero to a young Mary. And so the, the, the kind of uh, emboldening of the narrative comes from those kind of, you know, fragments of, of her life that like um, have come to represent her in, in the world. Hmm. Give us the blues, Timokos. Yeah. It's Ooh. 
<laughs> We're going to give Mary a moment to disrobe and come out of the character of the red figure. And we will have a few minutes for a question and answer session. So if there's been anything bubbling up that you are eager to ask, you will have a moment to do so in just a, a short while. Uh, and while we wait for Mary to come back, I just want to extend a huge thanks for this deep and rich and detailed unpacking and offering from, from Mary Samande, Lawrence, Pretty, Tembing Corsi. Thank you so much. The centre is extremely excited to have hosted this, this work this evening. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this short Q&A session that we have now. If you need to rush off, this is the moment for you to do so, because uh, we build it as 60 to 90 minutes, and we're on 20 past 8. So if you do need to leave, you are welcome to do so at this point. Thank you for joining us. If you are going to stay on, wonderful that you will do so. And another round of applause. Mary Savannah. We have two roving mics. <laughs> we'll take them as we see hands come up over there. The mic is coming to you now. Um, hello. So Hi. there was a brief mention of kind of, I think it was to do with the one where the woman was standing like this, mm -hmm. of the kind of like the biblical significance of that and the reference to Christian imagery. In terms of this work, especially with um, the kind of like, I don't know exactly what it's called, but like the shepherd's staff and the sheep or the lambs. So. Does that, is there any connection there playing into that kind of imagery in this work, or is it? You mean this work and? Yeah, the one up on the screen right now. No, no, I don't. Not what are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> what are you so asking you, me? It is the religious. You mentioned, oh. you mentioned, yeah, the religious link in, the, in one of the works you were discussing. I wanted to um, know Religion that. actually um, takes a, a corner once in a while in my, in my work. I was brought up in church, and at the same time, I am questioning what is Christianity to me. This was um, a foreign concept that was introduced to our people, my people, so my people tell me. Um, so in a way, actually the stuffing, or well, the stuff, um, here I'm using it as the, re the, the red figure is the mother of these um, dog. So with the staff, she's actually um, controlling them. So it's like this thing that you know these dogs are looking at as they are right now. So it's a form of control, controlling these red dogs. Yes, Gordon. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, yes, Gordon. When you were at the University of Johannesburg with us, um, you initially wanted to be a fashion designer. And I think it's quite fabulous that you've come back to the point where material and dressmaking and all those kind of things are part of what your oeuvre is. Can you unpack that a little bit for us, please? Hmm. Well, that's true. I seriously wanted to be a fashion designer. Um, so fine art was my second option. So when I got to UJ, they were like, no, packed, it's full, can't be a fashion designer. Think of, <laughs> think of a second option. It was like, Okay, I'll take art, because I think I can draw. <laughs> um, so from there on, you know, sometimes the universe will make a decision on your behalf. And I feel like it, it pushed me into the right direction. I don't know, you never know. Um, but in, in a way, um, that idea of love of fashion and fabric and the use of fabric is everywhere in the work, from the vegetation to the sheep skin, the, 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 the stage, the backdrop, the dresses themselves, because some of these dresses that I make are actually larger than this room. So I think it's me just you know, still going into fashion. But now <laughs> the fashion is just beyond street fashion. It's 
now the dress is actually taking over space. Because I feel like um, fashion designers, sometimes I may be wrong, I feel like they are limiting their dressmaking. Imagine a, I don't know, a dress that looks like, I don't know, an elephant. I'm just saying. <laughs> no. So yeah. Hello. Hi. So I have a question since like, I'm, I'm a visual artist myself. I'm a student at UJ and I, I have a question about, I see that you're very picky when it comes to fabric and the uh, photographers you work with. And my question to you is since you are very, I don't know, I'd say controlled with the, with the materials and the, actually with everything in your work, I wanted to ask in terms of like audience, do you also have like, do you feel as if, I don't know, you're in control of who sees your work and how they see it or how they view it? Because I was thinking about things like, you know, performance artists like musicians and stuff, where, where they go big, they, it's a matter of can you afford the ticket or not? And if you can't afford the ticket, it's sort of like you feel left out so to speak. So I wanted to ask whether do you have control of the audience and the people that you let in to view your work and your performance? Because I find it to be a very intimate thing or, mm -hmm. yeah, sort of like you sharing trauma or the history of your, or you just sharing the history of your mother and your great grandmother, the story. Do you feel as if you have the matter of choice as to who you share that story to? And, okay, and how yeah, do I, I think that's the question. No, I think as, a, as an artist, you can't be a dictator of, no, these people can't see my work, these people can. You just take the work out there and um, how people read or view the work, it's up to them. It depends on the kind of education. Um, they, they, they have, it depends on their geography. It just depends on knowledge and how they actually read, them, the, the re read um, the, the image. And also someone can actually not see the religious connotation on this stuff, which is, oh, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a stuff that, um, what do you call them, shepherd use mm. to control their animals. They won't see like, oh, there's a Mary there, the other Mary, not me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so you can't, you can't control, you just take the work out there and then people will view it in whatever way they view it. And once in a while you come out and talk about the work and, Ex explain or share your experiences. And if maybe there might be a relation, there might not be, and that's also fine, that's art. We have a question over here. Thank you so much, uh, your work's amazing. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because you're making uh, references to things like Greek mythology and, and Shakespeare and what I see, Maybe in my mind, I wanted to maybe uh, 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 talk a little further. I see African uh, more imagery, conception, not necessarily maybe Shakespeare, but exists in that. So I was quite interested in those references. Um, yeah, uh, the Shakespeare, the Greek mythology, uh, is it verses or, yeah, I'm not sure if it's verses, mm -hmm. or is it all of them, are they all in there? Uh, and then just a, a second one on in terms of you were speaking about motherhood. It might interest you what sort of conceptions of visual of motherhood are forming in, in my head. You, yeah, forming for you. Well, my you kid is eight years old. <laughs> Actually, there is. Um, so now, right now, I'm making small figurines, and um, at some point, it's like I really want to make small works. Because um, my work is usually big and just like larger than life or, or my height. Um, I thought, well, if I were to make these small figures out of um, clay, um, how would I make the hands? Because the hands are actually the most difficult um, part in a body, whether you're drawing them or sculpting them. Because um, sometimes they might just end up look like, look like five sausages on one hand. <laughs> so. <laughs> So my son um, has a few toys. And then one day I was looking at Lord Voldemort. <laughs> I was looking at his hands. I'm like, actually, this doll is actually amazing. Look at the details on the hands. I was like, this is it. I'm just going to take the hands and put them in what I'm working on. So easily, 
I was done with that. It's actually done because it's in my studio. Um, I was done within five weeks because I avoided the hands. And that was the first question that you asked me. <coughs> oh, references, yes. Well, the thing is, um, if, you're travel, if, you, if, you, if you've been traveling the world, um, your experiences shift. Then your experiences are not local anymore. Um, other, other, other concepts, other writers, other, other icons um, influence the studio practice. Um, when I speak of emotions, I actually read a book by um, somebody, Tandy Mbense. You should Google it when you get a chance. She speaks of emotions, how people feel emotions, how people um, experience emotions <coughs> in comparison to animals. So there are um, local um, writers or um, even image makers like um, when I speak of my performances in front of a camera, which is this, um, I studied um, Tracy Rose's work, and she's local, she's a local international artist, and I admire her work and I admire how she uses um, iconography to actually relay a story, that whatever story she wants to tell. So if you're traveling, the next thing I'll make, be making work about, I don't know, uh, I don't know, yeah, like stuff. It's just, um, I've always felt the need to share my experiences. Writers write and make things. Um, as you've been here tonight, we've gone to Brazil, we've been, we've been to Japan, we've been to England, we've been everywhere. And also, actually, the work is grounded here because these are my experiences. I'm a black woman in South Africa and I live in Joburg. I don't live anywhere else. So they won't be, yeah, I think. There was one more question in the front, Elvis, if you could bring the mic down, and, that, and then after that, William, and that'll have to be the last, uh, after William, the last one for the evening. Down here. So three. <coughs> so one, two, three. William will be last, yeah? So. Hi, Mary. Um, Hi, you. Your work's amazing. Thank you. Uh, incredible, truly. Um, when we grow up, we want to be just like you. We just want to get that out the way. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, from when you were a student um, to when you got your first big break to, uh, to now, how did you fund it? Um, how, did you, how did you secure the funding? Um, and was it a matter of maybe more strategic relationships at the start of your career? Um, or was it more like things like um, having access to the studio at school and stuff like that and pivoting that to maybe closing down the first um, show and so on. I'm just, I'm just curious how it all went. Hmm. So um, the first mask that I did of myself, actually Gordon was there. Um, Gordon, you directed me to Angus Taylor because I didn't have the money to make. Because Gordon was like, no, you need to cast your face with silicone. I was like, how much is this silicone? <laughs> um, <laughs> And then he was like, no, go to Angus. I've already spoken to him. And then um, that's how I learned to cast my face. So, um, and then after that, um, I was fortunate enough that I joined a gallery just right after my undergrad. And, um, and they've been sponsoring all these crazy ideas that I've, that I've had. And then of course, um, once in a while, you apply for funding, but it's kind of limited in South Africa. Yeah. So just, you know, being, and of course, when your work grows, you get invited by museums. Um, some of the works that I have here actually were sponsored or I, actually the, the purple work with the, with, with the, with the roots that was, um, that was made during my residency um, in Paris. So they sponsored the whole thing. They paid the students, all the assistance, the fabric, etc. The only thing was just, I had to be there and make the work, which is actually amazing for me. Yeah. yeah. So you get opportunities like that. There's no, there's no manual. You just have to make great work and just work hard. <laughs> so, so I was informed that I missed a hand earlier, and I'm sorry. So it's going to be, so it goes from there. We'll go to Irene, then to Sammy, then to William. <coughs> Yeah. 
I just appreciated your reference to the dogs in 76. And I wondered what your personal experience, if any, of those horrible, aggressive dogs is that might have informed what you made. Um, it's not really personal per se. It's just what I've read about what I've been told. Um, in 1976, I was not even born. I was not even, my mother was, I don't know, like, my, my mother was born in 1962. Um, but, but, um, but history books and images um, have created that relationship, have created that tense relationship with dogs. Because um, as, as I mentioned earlier on, to, um, these dogs were used to insert fear. So they were not men's best friend. Maybe in other parts of South Africa, but in the township, <laughs> no. When you see a dog run, and then, of course, the dog sometimes will chase you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, on that note, just to end, is that I had a Greek uncle who said, if I come back to this earth, I want to be a dog, but not in Greece, mm. in South Africa, where they treat dogs so uh, there's, I, I guess it depends on where you are in, your, in terms of geography. Like in the black community, you don't take ownership of a dog. It's over there. And also, I understand why. Because um, when, 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 um, when, when, when the mines were um, actually opening up, they needed young men to come and work in the mines. Actually, my grandfather is a, was a miner. Um, so um, to get these young people out of the homelands, they had to introduce text. So text of the, the heart and also the dog. So that's why people like in the town, she's like, no, it's not my dog, it's somebody else's dog. So it's, it, I think for me, it started then. So this idea of just not owning a dog, but you know, it's like a dog from, it's, it's here in the yard, but it's not in the house. Yeah. So I think that's where it all started. It's, it's a different, yeah, way. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was really fascinated by what you were saying about um, your work creating new mythologies, um, and then obviously looking at all that hybrid mythologies. And for you, when does a, a story or an image stop being a story and become a mythology or like a cosmology beyond the story? That's, that, that's a difficult one because sometimes you're like, I should have done this, I should have edited, it should have been a video, it should have been a moving image. Um, so it's just always this back and forth in the studio, like this cha-cha-cha move. Um, and as, as, as a creative, you have to make a decision, like, is it going, does it make sense for the idea or concept to be, um, to be a sculpture, or does it actually make sense for it to be a performance that would later be a photographic print? So it's just one of those push and pulls that you, as a creative, you have to make that decision. Last two. Sammy and then William. So one. Yeah. I'm so fascinated with um, the exploration of rage and anger um, as a black woman. And I'm fascinated with your externalization of this in the work you are making and how the, your figure, the alter ego, is still. Um, and this, this um, work speaking to that as well. Why externalize? I personally, I know it's not cute to be an angry black woman. I know there's been <laughs> stereotypical images of the yeah. angry black woman. So I want to know why the externalization of this rage and this experience for exploration and healing through rage. I guess it's part of healing, healing us as a people. But that's broad also, because maybe I'm only healing myself. People don't want to see angry dogs to heal themselves. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a way of understanding. I think when one is understanding who they are and where they come from and why they are what they are, there's peace. There's just internal peace. And um, as I mentioned, like writers write about rage or whatever feelings they have or ideas they have. Um, I make um, objects, art objects. And for me, this is a way of just dealing with what I know or, or dealing with um, my personal history or dealing with um, or just talking and sharing um, stories of my family because this is actually not unique to my family. 
um, a lot of people, especially in this room, well, actually, they're sharing the same sentiments. They have a grandmother like this, they have an aunt, they have, you know, who, who, who was a domestic worker. So we all have these shared um, histories. And of course, sometimes they come from different angles. But I feel like some, as, as, as people, to actually understand each other, we have to share stories. That's how we can understand. Um, Mary, firstly, I, I don't have a question. I have, firstly, just a big thank you on behalf of the centre for your neighbourliness just across the way to come and actually give such an insight into so many things we've glimpsed through the door and seen and understand the process and the thinking behind the process. I just want to end with a comment about the damn problem of hands, as this is an artist to another. I know, because you asked me when you came to yes. the studio. How did you do the small hands? And what was very reassuring, I saw an exhibition of Rodin and Rodin's work, a great French sculptor. He had a habit of going around antique shops. In those days, you couldn't buy Roman sculptures and chopping off their hands. Ah. And he had a drawer full of hands, <laughs> some of which he'd made himself, some of which his students had made, some of which he'd bought from antique shops. And when he was working on his sculptures, he'd say, well, let's try this hand and stick it on. Yeah. If that didn't work, he'd try another one. <laughs> and it had a leg. He really did a good leg in one sculpture. He'd take that and use it in another. So that sense of being a scavenger of objects and images and fragments feels uh, familiar. So, mm. But just an enormous thank you to you. Well, thank you. For this.